Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this virtual community meeting to discuss the development of a temporary micro shelter site at 602 North Orchard Street. We are pleased to see so many of you joining us today, and we know that this is a different setting than our typical community meeting. So before we get started, I would like to go over some technical pieces you should know. This event is being recorded and will be made available on our website for those who are not able to attend at this time. If you would like to ask a question, please look for the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our moderator will be passing your questions on to our staff panelists following the presentation. You can ask general questions or you can direct questions to a specific panelist. This virtual meeting is also being translated into Spanish in real time. To listen to the discussion in Spanish, you will need the most recent version of the Zoom app. Please look for the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom window and select Spanish to hear the interpreter. Please note that the information you are using to access this virtual community meeting via Zoom is subject to future public disclosure requests. Comments and questions received in the Q&A section will also be posted on our website. In addition to our presenters who will be leading the discussion and fielding questions, Councilmember John Hines is on the call to hear resident questions and concerns. Before we get started, I would like to introduce Councilmember Hines to offer some opening remarks. Councilmember Hines. Thank you, Allison, and uh, thank you everyone who, for joining us this evening. Um, I know I've talked to many of you over the last couple of weeks about this project, and so I'm excited that we're gonna be all together um, to be able to discuss kind of what is being proposed and for you to hear from all of the people that have been involved with this and kind of is moving it forward. Um, something I do want to just mention, there's a couple numbers that I like to talk about that keep me up at night. The first one is 1,497. There are 1,497 children in the Tacoma Public School System that are currently homeless or experienced homelessness in the 2019 2020 school year. That's larger than any high school in the city of Tacoma. Over 200. There are over 200 people last year in the city of Tacoma who are experiencing homelessness whose last permanent address was the 98406 zip code, the one that I live in and the one that many of you live into. Over 100. Over 100 of those 200 people who were la whose last address was in the 98406 zip code utilized emergency shelter opportunities like the one that is proposed for Six and Orchard and like the one on 60th and McKinley. In 2019, I talked to thousands of people throughout District 1, and the number one issue they talked to me about was homelessness and wanting to help people that are experiencing homelessness. I take that very seriously, and I think this is an opportunity for us as a city to step up and move some of the most vulnerable people that are currently living on the streets in our city into housing, stability, and a brighter future. Every homeless child we house is one fewer homeless adult. This is an opportunity for us to not make an investment in today, but an investment in the years to come in the city of Tacoma. I understand this is different. This is unique. This has never happened in my neighborhood or our neighborhood. But I think tonight you're gonna to hear how we intend to make this project work, how we intend to support people in our community who are already here and help them have a better life in our community. I'm very eager to hear your questions and I'm more than happy to answer all of them. When I first heard about this project, I had many questions and I had all of them answered. I visited the site on 60th and McKinley. I've talked to all the people involved in this project and I feel confident living a block away with my family that this project, if it goes forward, will be a real asset to the city of Tacoma and my neighborhood. So thank you all for joining us. I know the vice presidential debate was happening this evening and so many of you are choosing to be here with us instead of watching that. If you have friends who made the other choice, which I don't think was a good one, because this is the most important thing happening right now, um, you can tell them that this um, town hall is going to be recorded and they can watch it later on the website. 
So thank you all for joining us. And Allison, that was the end of my comments. And I look forward to hearing from the rest of our panel and all of our participants. Thank you very much, Council Member Hines. I'm going to take a moment to share my screen again and introduce Linda Stewart, who is the Director of Neighborhood and Community Services, uh, to start our presentation. Linda? Thank you, Allison, and, and thank you, Council Member Hines, for being here tonight. Thank you to everyone who's tuning in tonight uh, for being here and to listen and to allow us to listen to you and answer your questions. It's an honor to be here in service to the City of Tacoma as your Director of Neighborhood and Community Services. So Neighborhood and Community Services is actually the department that has the primary responsibility for managing the city's response to homelessness. The city is currently operating under two declarations of emergency that relate to the establishment of this particular micro shelter site. In May of 2017, the city declared a public health state of emergency related to homelessness and encampments. The initial declaration stemmed from the presence of encampments throughout the city, including a large encampment located on Portland Avenue. Through that emergency declaration, the city established the stability site, which is located at 1423 Puyallup Avenue. Now, since the, the, since the initial declaration of emergency, council has extended it twice as the city continues to face adverse public health effects related to the presence of encampments throughout the city. In late 2019, the council added a performance metric to the declaration that requires access to shelter for 95% of individuals counted in the point in time count for three consecutive years. In a moment, I'll touch on our number of available shelter beds, but what we know is that we don't have enough available shelter to meet the needs of our unhoused community members and the expansion of available shelter beds is critical to assisting us in addressing this emergency. In addition to the state of emergency and homelessness, we also have declared a public health emergency related to COVID-19. In traditional shelter settings, shelter is often provided only overnight and often in settings where several clients are located in one room. Under COVID-19 emergencies, uh, the city has a directive to develop what is called non-congregate shelter, which is shelter that allows individuals to shelter in place and allow for appropriate six-foot social distancing. In addition to expanding some of our, expanding, our existing shelter operations to 24-7, to allow individuals to shelter in place, the development of this particular micro shelter site will assist the city in meeting our non-congregate shelter directives. So as I mentioned, we know we're short of the number of shelter beds we need to serve people experiencing homelessness in our community. The 2020 point in time count which is a snapshot of our homeless population taken on a one day in January, showed that we had 544 individuals experiencing homelessness in Tacoma and 1,897 individuals experiencing homelessness in Pierce County. So to support working to end the public health state of emergency on homelessness, the city manager established a goal of expanding shelter capacity by 100 units by the end of 2020. Over this year, we've actually achieved an expansion of 169 units. And with this new site, we'll add another 40 units for 209 new, new units. We're already working at a deficit to meet the need in our community and the current pandemic and resulting economic crisis is increasing housing instability in our community. As we work to develop housing for low-income households, as well as longer-term solutions, such as permanent supportive housing, we are also working to develop shelter locations that meet the immediate need of individuals experiencing homelessness. The city continues to work with faith-based and nonprofit partners to identify possible shelter locations, and we are committed to focusing on locations currently underserved by shelter sheltering individuals in a safe, secure, and managed environment mitigates the impacts of homelessness for individuals 
and our entire community. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Allison to discuss both the city's experience with other micro shelter sites, as well as some features of the proposed site at 602 North Orchard. Allison? Thank you very much, Linda. Prior to discussing the proposed location at 602 North Orchard, I would like to share some of the outcomes of the site at 802 MLK and our current site at East 60th and McKinley. Over the life of the site at 8th and MLK, it served 65 residents and had 15 exits to housing. There were only 15 calls for service at 802 MLK during its period of operation, 13 of which were for medical services and two for police response. Importantly, neither of the TPD calls resulted in arrest. I also have received several questions regarding the 8th and MLK site and why it is closed. Uh, when we developed that site, we knew it was going to be there for a limited time so that low-income senior housing could be developed uh, starting in July of this year. And that project is underway. At East 60th and McKinley, the site has served 72 individuals since opening in July. Although I do want to make sure everyone is aware there are only 65 individuals on site at any given time there. It has successfully exited eight of those individuals to housing. There have been eight calls for service on this site, five of which were for medical services and three for police response through September 28th. Again, none of those TPD calls have resulted in arrest. I did have some residents after we made a presentation to council with this information note that uh, during COVID several arrests arrest types cannot be made. So I do wanna clarify those calls for service were for two for welfare checks and one for a verbal altercation on site. Again, no, everything was resolved on site and nothing resulted in arrest. I would now like to turn the conversation over to Michael Mira with the Tacoma Housing Authority, who is our property owner at our East 60th and McKinley site for some discussion of why the Tacoma Housing Authority partnered with the city at that location. Michael? Thank you, Allison. Uh, my name is Michael Mira. I'm the executive director of the Tacoma Housing Authority. I appreciate this chance to participate in this discussion. <clears throat> it is an important one. T Tacoma Housing Authority made its land at 60th and McKinley available for several reasons. Um, we did not need any convincing about the need. Councilmember John Himes described it very well. Our city's in the middle of not only a homelessness emergency, but a pandemic to boot. And we did not need any further discussion about the value. But the need would not have been good enough for us to give our land for this purpose unless we had adequate assurances about all the worries that are surfacing in this discussion about sixth and orchard we had the same questions the city is receiving now and it was important to us to get adequate assurances from both the city and lehigh about the answers and we got them we wrote those assurances into the management of the site it's now been about three almost four months since it opened and I'm here to report our experience has been very positive. The experience of our neighbors have been very positive. And in making that judgment, we rely on our neighbors who bring a view of the question that can only come from someone who lives nearby. So I hope our experience is informative for this discussion. And if I can answer any further question, I will try to do that. Thank you very much, Michael. And now I'd like to turn the conversation to Pastor Barbara Blaisdale from First Christian Church, who is the property owner for the proposed site at 602 North Orchard, to share why the church is interested in serving the community in this manner. Pastor Blaisdale? Pastor Blaisdell, you're on mute. I apologize. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, let me share my gratitude for the chance to be here this evening 
and uh, share with our neighbors uh, the reason we have uh, brought this proposal uh, to the city for their consideration. Um, the, the church purchased the land many, many years ago before I was born, actually, um, because it had a vision of serving the neighborhood that would eventually grow around it. And uh, because of the beautiful people who came before uh, those of us who are here now, that the congregation has a long history of wanting to generously share um, that gorgeous piece of property uh, that we so love. And, and so we have tried to do that with all of our neighbors um, throughout our time in the neighborhood. Um, our ministry does include um, uh, many neighbors who are members of our congregation, folks who live right uh, next door uh, from uh, 12th Avenue and uh, uh, some south of the church and on up north. A few years ago, we uh, experienced several families within the congregation who lived in the neighborhood who became at risk for homelessness or experienced um, or who were experiencing homelessness. And the church being um, felt called to uh, help with that and spent thousands of dollars um, over the last several years helping uh, try to keep three or four or five families at risk for homelessness from becoming homeless and to help uh, rehouse, get uh, a couple of families rehoused who had um, lost their homes. But in the last, I would say, two years, we have had um, an increasing number of people from our neighborhood come to the church wanting help with a plan uh, because they have uh, lost their homes and they wanted help getting back into housing. And we have not been in a position to provide a safe answer for them. Um, and that hasn't been acceptable to us. And let me just uh, offer a, a quick story. Um, just a few weeks ago, I came to the office early one morning and in our courtyard was um, a young mother with her four-year-old and her two-year-old. They'd spent the night there. And the terrifying thing for me uh, was that I could not guarantee their safety. Many of you have mentioned to us uh, the crime that's increased in the neighborhood. Well, the church has been a, a victim of that, uh, the same as uh, everyone else. And we are aware and, and have uh, put in security cameras and tried to be vigilant to make sure that those who have criminal intention are not um, allowed to remain on the property. Having said that, we, are, we do not have um, the capability of providing 24 seven security. And so that young mother and her two babies were not safe. So we began to look for partners who might help us think of ways that we could reach out again to the homeless neighbors, neighbors, people in our neighborhood who could um, help us uh, make a difference. Um, and that's how the conversation began with the Low Income Housing Institute and how they connected us then with uh, the city of Tacoma. And we began the conversation about this possibility. I would just close um, I, with uh, a couple of sentences from an email I received last night from one of those church members who has um, received help from the church to keep 
her family from homelessness. And uh, she wrote that uh, her appreciation for that loving unity, that uh, she felt like what the church has given her family is a hand up and not just a hand out. And the other powerful thing in her note was a quote from her son who is now in seventh grade. And she asked him what his home meant to him at, uh, and what would have happened had they lost it. And he clearly knows some of those children um, who, have, who have to go to school um, and are experiencing homelessness because he said, it must be awful to have to go to school dirty and to be teased about that. And I'm grateful I don't have to do it. And I want us to help other children not have to do that. So that, that's our motivation um, to help our neighbors. Uh, I hope you will hear tonight that we worked hard to find folks who could help us do that safely. And again, we're grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Pastor. I will now turn the briefly turn the presentation to Lou Pritchard with the Affordable Housing Consortium to discuss their perspective on the need for services and our model. Lua? Thank you very much, Allison. And just listening to Pastor Barbara, wow, what, how incredible it is. And now that's what a church should be. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Lua Pritchard. I'm the executive director of Asia Pacific Cultural Center. Today I am here in my role as a board member representing the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium. The consortium is a nonprofit membership organization which provides education and advocacy for the creation of more affordable housing across Pierce County. Our 60 members represent those involved in affordable housing the nonprofit and the for-profit developers who build it, financers that fund it, architects that design it, nonprofits that provide the services for those who live in it, and property managers that oversee it and local government partners. That's what Affordable Housing Consortium is. The consortium has a vision that everyone in our community will have access to safe, healthy, affordable housing. Lehigh has been making our vision a reality since 1991. And we support this new project as it makes the opportunity of housing a possibility for our neighbors. Before ever hearing of COVID-19, Tacoma and Pierce County was experiencing an affordable housing and homelessness crisis. The mandatory restrictions for combating the COVID-19 pandemic are affecting many households, but are disproportionately impacting lower wage earners. These residents are least likely to have the resources available like savings and family supports to weather the fallouts of the pandemic. We expect that once the eviction moratorium ends, mass evictions will leave many of our neighbors homeless with nowhere to turn. While acknowledging the concerns expressed by community members who live or work around First Christian Church, we look at the, po the positive experience of the current tiny home village located on the east side. And I'm very confident that those results will be replicated at this site. We need more housing. This tiny home community comes at a time when we really need it the most and provides a solution to the lack of housing Tacoma faces. First Christian Church offers their land as a place where people of modest income could have shelter, find dignity, find community, and live side by side with people of all races, creeds, ages, abilities, and diverse life experiences. Collectively, we all have a responsibility 
to ensure that conditions for well being are made available to all in our community. For these reasons, Affordable Housing Consortium of Pierce County stands behind the work of Lehigh and is here in support of this tiny home project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lua. I'm gonna share my screen again, so bear with me a moment. And thank you to all of our community partners for sharing their perspectives. Now to turn to the proposed site at 602 North Orchard Street. As the pastor referenced, the church has been working through how they might serve the less fortunate in our community for some time. And Lehigh was able to work with the city and the county to identify a possible spending source with the State Department of Commerce's shelter program. The city and the county did make a joint application for those funds in July. When we learned that we would receive those funds, we went ahead and made a presentation on September 15th and mentioned this site as a possibility during our study session briefing. On that same day, Councilmember Hines issued a press release in support of the site. And that next evening, Councilmember Hines and myself attended the Weston Neighborhood Council to provide a high level briefing. Throughout September and into this month, staff have been fielding calls and emails regarding the site as well as performing door-to-door -door outreach and attending meetings such as the one Councilmember Hines, myself, and Pastor Blaisdell attended yesterday with Disciples Terrace. Staff remains available to attend any neighborhood meetings. Should you have a need, please feel free to contact shelters at cityoftacoma.org or 253-591-5119 and we can get that scheduled. I do want to make sure the public is clear that on October 20th, the lease agreement and the operator agreement for the site will be coming before council for authorization. Pending that authorization, the site setup will begin this month and setup does happen quickly. The site at 8th and MLK was constructed and populated in 41 days. Similarly, the site at East 60th and McKinley was constructed and populated in 45 days. We anticipate that site setup will be substantially complete and residents will begin moving in in early December. We expect the site to operate with residents until June 2023, and the micro shelters will be removed and site returned to the church in July of 2023. We have referred to the site as both 602 North Orchard and Sixth and Orchard. I do want to provide an understanding for folks of where the site will be located on the church's property. It will be to the north of the church, between the church building and Disciples Terrace within that yellow boundary you see outlined. The diagram here shows the proposed layout with 40 units on site. The maximum number of individuals that will be served on the site at any given time will not exceed 60. As previously discussed, there are restrooms, showers, laundry, dining, and counseling facilities, which are represented by blue boxes on this diagram. The entrance and exit to the site will be located on the southeastern side of the site, so folks will exit and enter from basically the church's parking lot. I shared earlier some of the successes of the current site. Part of that success is due to the operational model that the Low Income Housing Institute, or Lehigh, brings. I would now like to, oh, excuse me, no, that's not true. I'm going to show you a couple more things about this site. The site boundary is fenced and with controlled entry. It has 24 seven on staff on site and is equipped with security cameras. Again, there will be 40 units on site serving no more than 60 individuals at a time. And I think it's important to emphasize in case it was missed in earlier commentary, this site will serve homeless families, single women and couples. And again, there are common areas throughout the site which include restrooms, showers, laundry, case management office, communal kitchen, and trash and recycling. Now I would like to turn the presentation to Sharon Lee with the Low Income Housing Institute to share about Lehigh's model. Sharon? Good evening, thank you very much. I wanted to um, explain and give a little background. I'm Sharon Lee, Executive Director of um, Lehigh, 
and um, we are a nonprofit housing organization, and we operate in the Puget Sound region, and we manage over 2,300 units of affordable housing. And I just want to say why um, we're doing micro shelters and tiny house villages. It's because it takes so long to build affordable housing. It could take a year to find a site, two or three years to get permits and financing and then start construction. And so we got so frustrated, so frustrated at the slow pace of building bricks and mortar traditional housing. And we saw the homeless population continue to grow. So we decided what can we do that would be quick and humane? And we did not want to see people living in tents and living in the cold and getting wet and living without heat. So we tried to pioneer the idea of um, tiny houses. And it's sort of caught on. And we are now, we have um, eight villages in Seattle two in Olympia, and this would then be a second one in Tacoma. And the difference is that instead of being sleeping in a car or out on the street, um, people are in a heated, heated tiny house that's insulated. And they can have their, you know, their children, their pets, and their belongings. And they have a locking door. And they have the support of staff on site. Critical to the support includes um, case managers. So one of these uh, micro shelters will be, um, in this case, two of them will be housing case managers, which are social workers. So if you don't have your ID, you have to get your ID. If you um, have to enroll your kids in school, you need help with that. If you um, need to apply for work, or get back in school, the case manager will help do that. And the whole idea is that this is a bridge to housing. This is a solution for you to stay warm and dry, have nutritious food, have hygiene facilities, and then be able to move into long-term or permanent housing, or in some cases, reunite with um, family or friends. So we, um, operate this because um, it's a successful model because there's a code of conduct that villagers have to follow and there's a management plan and a service plan and in particular there's unused and vacant land that is um, that's that can be used for a short term before let's say on a temporary basis um, and that can really benefit people who are unhoused and who are in desperate need. Um, we have, especially with the coronavirus, we have so many people who are at risk of getting sick of, um, with the winter coming, with um, exposure um, and living on the street, especially for women um, and families. It's not safe, um, it's risky, and it's something we wanna do is to protect vulnerable people. And I in particular want to thank um, Council Member Hines, and I also want to thank um, Council Member Hunter for being here with us. Thank you. And I want to thank also um, the city staff who have been um, um, so supportive. And, and, you know, of course, you know, they require our management plan and they require, you know, um, that we um, follow the code of conduct and we will. So I wanted to um, say that um, we hope to have, and um, you know, many of the tiny houses, micro shelters are eight feet by 12, and, and half of them are being donated by um, volunteers and donors who have built them, including students, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, vocational programs, businesses. So many people are concerned about um, people who are unsheltered and unhoused. Um, but we hope to have a um, open house we would love to have the neighbors come and help us and pitch in and get and then you know these will be occupied in December um, and then we also hope that you will continue to support the residents um, the neighbors um, who are um, you know who are trying to get their lives together and stay safe 
So I want to um, quickly um, introduce um, Josh Castle, Eric Davis, and Ronnie Brown. So I think um, the first person would be, um, would that be, um, Allison, would that be Eric Davis who would talk about um, operations? Yes, ma'am. And if he'd also introduce Ronnie when he's done with his commentary. Okay, great. Hi guys, my name is Eric Davis. I'm special projects manager for TEMPS and a Lehigh employee. Um, <clears throat> at TEMPS and any, mostly any tiny house village, we have 24 seven security. The safety and the dignity that comes from that is just overwhelming. Um, one of the things I've noticed you guys were saying just a moment ago is how important it was for that family to get off the street and, you know, sit out in the church parking lot like that and um, all the theft and crime. Well, when you have those villages around, it gives them a place safe to go. It takes a lot of uh, village errors to actually operate the village. But what my job is to ensure that it stays safe, it stays clean and sober for one, and one of the main things is making sure everyone has uh, the opportunity to participate in this village. Um, as well as being a good neighbor to our community, we also in, in, in using them uh, the same thing as um, life itself. When they come in those doors, they have a new sense about themselves. They're not scared, they're not afraid of anything, just having heat and things like that. So what I wanna point out is during COVID right now, not only do we keep it sanitized four times a day, each villager is required to participate in um, um, chores. And those chores are mainly sanitizing the village. One of the first things we wanna do is practice those protocols for that. Um, we make sure there's no theft, there's no fighting, violence is not tolerated. Um, I, I just can't tell you enough about what the importance is of having these villages because I get teary eyed. But uh, to see it in Tacoma right now is one of the best things I've noticed since I've been there since last year. I didn't know it was, you know, such a big problem like it is. I didn't see it. But since I've been there, I've got a passion for this. So I want to see those families, those kids, everybody I can to get in these tiny old villages because it's the safest, peaceful, it's warmest environment because we encourage them to have hope and to believe themselves and to know that they are somebody. And when they gain that dignity back, they go into case manager's office and they start to relive their lives by looking for work, getting IDs, applying for housing, watching people just coming out the tent and going in there in three days, maybe a week or so, they have a smile, then a month or two, watching them move out was one of the biggest things that kept me doing it. So, Tiny House Village is one of the biggest things I can say you can promote at this time, at, especially with COVID going on. And uh, to be allowed to be accepted in the community is just shows what one can do when we all think together about the human life. So at the end, if you guys have questions about uh, what else we can do with the villages or anything we, I have to do with it, feel free to ask, I'll be here all night. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And would you mind introducing Ronnie for us? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. Ronnie Brown is next. He's a past resident. Ronnie, would you please go on? Yes, again, my name is Ronnie Brown. And uh, I just gonna quickly kind of share with you guys my experience before the village, life before the village. And uh, life before the village, I was a struggling vet, uh, suffering with PTSD. I lived in my vehicle for about two years. I had a mental relapse due to the fact that I had discovered two deceased bodies here at the Tacoma. One of them was up on the hilltop. Uh, one after, one morning, I was heading to uh, Safeways and I found a young man on the ground in front of the boat, broken spoke. And uh, I had to call it in. And then two weeks later, in the same spot, I found another body of an overdose. And it sent me into a frenzy, uh, caused me a divorce. I was on the streets for two years. I was broken, my spirit was broken. Uh, but then one day I was notified uh, by an old colleague of mine because I'd been clean and sober for 20 years and they pointed me towards the, the uh, village 
And I remember the day I came in the village, uh, I met Mr. Davis. Uh, he was speaking my language because my spirit was dead. I was broken and he met me where I was and I really identified with him. He shared his story with me and he showed a lot of empathy and he even encouraged me to uh, engage with applying for uh, a position called a key holder. And uh, when I applied for that position, uh, it changed things. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe how things just turned around. Uh, there was, it came to, to pass where we formed a team uh, and the team was the case manager and he was like the papa bear and we had ties, he was the mama bear. And all of a sudden people in the community started showing up. Uh, Joe Davies, Life Center, uh, Salvation Army. And every time we showed people the property, they were just astounded by the peacefulness, by the serenity. Uh, we had one business owner, he even donated a grill. It was a, a, a gas grill. And I remember the day we fired it up, it was a beautiful summer day. And the smell of that smoke just filled that block. And it was just amazing to see people happy uh, because when food shows up, it makes everybody happy. But yeah, we had a great time. And that's when the village seemed to take a cycle of just success. Uh, because the family started building through the leadership that these people put together. And uh, I, it, it was just amazing to me that uh, there was a time where I received an email from this outfit that recognized in my past that I was engaged with uh, outreach to help people get off of opioids and things of that nature because I was a recovery coach. And they notified me for a position. And I remember Ty, uh, she's one of the case managers there. She put together this elegant uh, resume, and it was the same day the resume was submitted from Lehigh's case manager. I had the interview, and I was hired, and it changed my life. I, I now work for a company called Boulder Care. Uh, Lehigh helped me get a place to live. I have a beautiful apartment. This is my office. I have a two-bedroom. I, I work out of my home. Uh, I provide peer coaching services. Uh, we have a company that has clinicians and care advocates, and we help people who are suffering with substance abuse, uh, which there were quite, quite some numbers there at the village. And that was the beautiful thing about it. Uh, people can come with all kinds of, of struggles and the villages would give everybody an opportunity. And for those of those who couldn't fall in the structure, I remember Mr. Davis would say things like, well, maybe it's time for them to discover America. And uh, that meant either you'd go and get your help that you needed or you just figure things out. But yeah, it was, it was just a, a great uh, group of people there that I, I think is gonna bless more. I was happy to, 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 to be able to come in there and, and, and be blessed because I would not be in this position had it not been for Lehigh and the support that uh, came from them. And I think one of the things that we all forget too is that the success of a village creates legacies. We have families, fathers, sons, daughters, and when their lives get turned around, that whole generation follows. So I, I just want you guys to know that uh, there's been a lot of restoration in my life with my family. It feels good to have my own place. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, for sharing your experience. Now I'd like to turn it over to Josh Castle with Lehigh to very briefly, Josh, talk about the Community Advisory Council and how that works. And I would ask you to keep your comments brief as I want to make sure we get time for Q&A today. And I had to follow Ronnie Brown. I knew that would be a tough act to follow. Hi everyone, I'm Josh Castle. I'm the Community Engagement Director with Lehigh. I'll keep this really brief because I know we want to get to questions. Um, so. So we have, uh, we have a CAC, a Community Advisory Committee. They exist for every village. The CACs are critical to the community engagement with, uh, with the neighbors and to hold us accountable um, to hear from you know, neighbors and local businesses um, and others in the community about how the village is going and provide advisory input to us and oversee the, uh, the operations, uh, the services residents are receiving um, and how the staff are doing and they, um, they meet every month. These are public meetings. Anybody can attend. The, uh, the, what the 
application to apply for it is on the city website, but I can also send it to you. And I'll leave my contact information if it's possible in the, in the chat. And these are made up of community stakeholders, uh, neighbors, businesses, providers, community leaders, schools, um, others, in, others in the neighborhood that are, have a stake in the village. Um, they're, like I said, they're a critical part of the success of the village. Um, these are committees where you can come and bring your questions if you have a concern, if you want to uh, volunteer or donate or be involved in some other way. Um, and even if you're not, a, if you end up not being a formal member, because we have seven to 10 people that can serve on the committee, you can still join this, this CAC meetings and participate fully in them, because like I said, they're public meetings. Um, so we will have that application available to send out. We have a, a CAC for our current site at 60th and McKinley. And their next meeting, by the way, anybody who's curious who would like to see how those go, you're welcome to attend that. That's on October 12th at 6 p.m. We're doing these on Zoom, so you don't have to go anywhere. It's all virtual now. Um, and then in addition to that, we have volunteer opportunities. We're doing this in uh, the, these new COVID times we're living in. Uh, a lot of opportunities that are virtual or small group and socially distant. Um, and then in addition to that, those who want to donate, we have a do donation wish list for the village as well. Uh, and there's opportunities to donate meals or, or items that, um, that residents need. So if you're interested in being involved, um, donating, serving on the CAC, uh, let me know and I'm happy to, uh, to engage with you on that. And I just want to thank all of the neighbors and the community leaders and the community groups who we've, in, who we've engaged with. And we've had a lot of good conversations and I look forward to having more of those. So thank you. Thank you, Josh. And Joe Davies, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your experience on the CAC with 8th and MLK so that folks get an understanding from a neighborhood perspective of what those are like. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, do, am I, can you see me? That's, that's one yes, of the things. We can, we can see you, Joe. Okay, I'm, I'm just curious because I, I can't. Um, so I was a member of the Community Advisory Committee for the MLK um, project, and I live just a block from the site. And my, uh, my experience with this is that there were no, as far as I know, there were no difficulties or problems. Once, once the site was established and people moved into the tiny houses, including Ronnie Brown, um, there, the, the atmosphere in the neighborhood just calmed right down. Now you have to remember that we were like six or nine months dealing with um, an illegal um, camp, encampment in People's Park. And that was very, very, very disturbing for um, everybody in our community. But once the tiny house went in, um, village went into um, operation, it just became, they were just neighbors, really, really neighbors. It, um, it gave everybody a chance to sort of take a deep breath, to look at what was actually happening and recognizing that people who were experiencing homelessness were just people who were who just were having a tough time. And it gives everybody in the neighborhood um, an opportunity to actually um, do more than give, give lip service to our support of, um, of ways of dealing with people who are experiencing homelessness. No problems at all. Now, we were only um, meeting, we only had four meetings because I think we were slow to get started and we had a very short timeline, but I'm hoping that for um, the 60th in McKinley and this new site that you will have a much longer time to work together and see what can be done. It's, it's exciting for you, lucky. Thank you very much, Joe. So uh, we're getting close to the end of our presentation and I thank you all for uh, listening uh, to all of our presenters this evening and we will get to your questions.
Uh, I do want to share that in talking with neighbors in the last few weeks, I've received several questions about encampments present in the neighborhood or property owners having concerns about loitering or other illicit behavior on their property. I want to make sure that residents are aware that they may contact 311 to have our homeless outreach team make contact with individuals in encampments. Further, business owners may contact Positive Interactions at 253-396-5065 for response to their business to assist with individuals experiencing homelessness. Positive Interactions will make contact and connect individuals to resources. In addition to those, there is Josh Castle's contact information if you are interested in joining the CAC or have other questions about Lehigh. And then if you have other questions or needs about neighborhood resources, please feel free to email shelters at cityoftacoma.org or 253-591-5119, which is my phone number. Again, some reminders about how you can volunteer and donate. We have had uh, community members ask about those opportunities. So you can email tinyhouses at lehigh.org. You are more than welcome to join the Community Advisory Committee. And again, we will be posting the application for that committee to our website at cityofsacoma.org forward slash authorized encampments. And at that same website, you can sign up for email updates on this site so that you uh, stay informed on that. Um, so I am now going to turn the conversation over to our moderator, Kenny, who will be uh, directing questions to us as panelists. Kenny? Hey everybody, I'm Kenny Coble. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the city. We have over 275 questions from y'all, and I came into this meeting with 12 pages of questions. So obviously there's a lot we want to talk about, so we're going to get to as many as we can. Just so you know, I'm gonna invite all everyone to turn off their cameras except for Allison and Councilmember Hines. I'm gonna direct questions to them. And then if Allison or the council member know of someone, an expert who can answer the question better than they can, then they'll call on them, okay? So let's get to as many questions as we can. You, you're welcome to keep submitting them. And I want you to know that um, Allison and her team are gonna work on getting answers to all these questions and posting them later. Um, it will take a little bit of time since we have so much interest, but we really want to make sure that people are heard. So our first question, Allison, is from Nancy. Nancy wants to know, will this be a drug and alcohol free zone? And thank you, Kenny, and thank you, Nancy, for the question. Yes, uh, substances are prohibited on site. Thank you. And some of these will be quick, some of these will take longer, and some of these will be comments too. So I want to give a variety of, so you can get a sense of what the community is asking, Allison. All right, next question. This is anonymous. How was this site decided on? Why did the community not have a say in the location? Thank you again, Kenny. And um, one of the key factors in uh, siting shelter is having willing property owners. So in this case, uh, First Christian Church was able to step forward to offer their property for this use, similar to our site at East 60th and McKinley, where THA was able to make that property available for use. But I do also want to emphasize that this site actually was identified during our 2019 work on um, convening to identify temporary and emergency shelter locations throughout our community. So Six and Orchard was specifically included uh, in those conversations. Thanks. Our next question, this person is wondering how is this being budgeted? Perfect. Um, so this is a combination of two, uh, a federal source of funding and a state source of funding. So there are what are called emergency solutions grant funds uh, available for COVID response. So we are using some of that dollars and then also those state commerce dollars that we applied for through their shelter program. And again, that was a joint application with the county. So there are several uh, county opportunities for shelter as well. Thanks. Most of these I'm asking verbatim, but we got a lot of questions about schools. So I just want to just um, paraphrase. Um, a lot of people are wondering about the multiple schools that are in the area and if you have thought about safety concerns, especially for um, young people walking to school and that would be walking um, past the site. Absolutely. And all of our micro shelter sites have been on uh, walking routes for schools. Um, so 8th and MLK was uh, on a walking route for Bryant Elementary. Uh, East 60th and McKinley 
uh, actually is located just on the backside of Stewart Heights Park and also has a private school in that vicinity. So um, working in a developed city like Tacoma, it is difficult to site um, shelter uh, outside of those kinds of community assets. Importantly, the shelter site is fenced. It is, uh, does have 24 seven security and part of the code of conduct for residents is no loitering around that site. So um, really, also if you recall the site design, it is set back on the church property away from Orchard Street. So when we think about kids coming to and from, let's say Wilson High School or using that bus stop, really they shouldn't have interaction uh, with the shelter location. Thanks, that actually leads a good follow-up question. We had people wondering um, if people are allowed to, if um, people staying in the village are allowed to have guests and be, bring people onto the site. Yeah, and that's a great question, Kenny. During non-COVID times, there are visitors allowed on site and there is a process for um, visitors to check in. They do have to check in with security and there are visiting hours, which generally run nine to five on our sites. However, during COVID, no visitation is allowed to those sites. And I believe and, Council Member Hines also wants to make a comment. And then just something, <clears throat> as I've had lots of conversations, this is different than a traditional shelter model where people queue up outside and wait for admittance at a certain time of day with all of their belongings. This will house residents. So they will live there. They will be inside. Um, they don't need to line up at 5 p.m. on the street and set up their tents, which is what people are concerned about, um, waiting to get in. They will be in. The other thing is no one else who's not a resident will be served at this site. So you can't just walk up and say, I want to be fed or I want clothing or I want services. The only people who will be served on the site will be the people that are there and no one can walk up and get services. So I think that's a concern people have is that this is going to be a hot spot. It's going to attract people. And I just would reiterate that it, the residents are the ones who are served on this site. It will be just a reminder, women, children, couples, they will be served on a site. Um, no one else can just walk up and get services. If that is, I, I hear that concern often, so I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you, council member. I'm gonna read a slightly longer comment. This is from the Tacoma Pierce County Coalition to End Homelessness, which is a loose network of individuals, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and community businesses working together to serve people experiencing homelessness. And they have about 50 to 100 participants per meeting every week. And they say, we are writing in support of the Thames project on, at Sixth and Orchard. Pierce County continues to lack adequate shelter. And this project is one of the many types of shelter the coalition strongly supports. Most recently in the May 18th um, uh, COVID-19 funding recommendations, these shelter beds will become available at a critical time. Our coalition is working hard to ensure that at least 400 winter shelter beds are created before the weather sets in. While the shelter will not come online until the end of December 2020, the fact that it is fully funded through July 2023 secures those beds well into the future. Every unit, every bed, every type of sh safe shelter will help people survive the coming winter. Participants in our coalition stand ready to help the people experiencing homelessness who will reside in this Thames site um, shelter. And then they say they want us to know that um, they voted um, to formally support this at a recent meeting. The comment's a little longer, but um, I'll save that for you to read in the document later. All right, and then next, I wanna ask a few questions from the same group. Um, the West, um, oh, sorry, let me get the name right. Um, the West End Neighborhood Council put a lot of work into asking a lot of questions, and because they represent so many people, I'm going to ask a few of their questions, if that's all right, Allison. Um, the first one is, how much money will First Christian Church receive in month monthly lease payments? Yeah, and Kenny, as a reminder, that lease agreement is coming to Council for authorization on the 20th of October. The monthly lease payment will be $3,000 a month. Thank you. This is still from the West End Neighborhood Council. Um, there are homeless or people experiencing homelessness living behind Kmart on a nearby vacant property. Will they be living in the village or remain in that um, encampment? 
Thank you for the question. I, the individuals uh, in the unauthorized encampment can be contacted by our homeless outreach team who will work with them to identify appropriate shelter. So if they qualify for shelter uh, in this particular uh, micro shelter site, then absolutely they could be cited there, but they also might be good candidates for shelter at our stability site, our other micro shelter site, or perhaps one of our overnight shelters. Allison, you asked this, you answered this a little bit, but I'm gonna bring it up again um, for clarity. Um, this person, the council also want to know, are residents allowed to leave the village, use alcohol and drugs, and then come back inside the village? Yep, Kenny, and I think it's important for folks to remember that individuals experiencing homelessness and residents of these micro shelter sites are not prisoners. They do have the ability to come and go. Um, they are residents of our community, just like you or I are. That said, uh, we have implemented a curfew at our East 60th and McKinley site, um, and that curfew over there is 11 p.m., so I would expect a similar type of curfew uh, to be probably put in place at the 602 North Orchard site. Um, yes, residents are free to leave the village and may use substances, uh, preferably legal substances, but if they wanted to go to, when bars are open, go to a bar and have a beer, that is something that they can do and they can re-enter the site. However, if their behavior is disruptive uh, or they are in violation of the code of conduct, then that will be addressed by the on-site uh, staff management of the site. Thank you. This last question I'm going to ask from the council is something that we got a lot in the questions. So I'm hoping a lot of people want to know about this. Um, are there services within walking distance of the village? If not, how will residents get the services they need, such as medical, medication, addiction services, counseling, mental health, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Case management services are provided on site. So folks do not need to leave for those services. That includes substance use counseling, mental health counseling, connection to employment services, that kind of thing. Lehigh also works with other area nonprofits to bring some of those services to the site as necessary. But if residents do need connection to something uh, that they can't get on site, then Lehigh does have the ability to uh, assist them with transportation to those. Um, services. Thank you. This next question is from and, Valerie. And council Member Hines would also like to uh, chime in here, so I have Thank you, Council Member. And, and just to reiterate, this is what the model is about. It's about providing people a stability, stable place where the services are brought to them, not that we, they need to be able to take, go somewhere to get services, right? So I know they hear the other concern. It's like, well, there's no grocery store within walking distance of these people going to walk with grocery carts from um, the Proctor Safeway, which more than happy than went to the Proctor Safeway Metropolitan Market. It's a wonderful store and wonderful place, um, but the food will be provided for them there. Um, the, the, we have groups that donate food, there's an on-site kitchen, so they don't need to go into the community to get food. I mean, they can, like yet again, Allison said, they're not prisoners, you know, they, they're, not, they're not forced to stay there forever, but um, th that's the model, is that the services are brought to them. That's what makes this unique and what makes this effective. Um, because they don't have to go somewhere to be served. Thank you, Council Member. Sorry for um, speaking over you. I'm managing four windows right now. Um, next question is from Valerie. Is there a curfew? I believe you mentioned there is, um, but what time is, um, is the curfew and are the gates locked? Kenny, thanks for the question again, and Valerie, thank you for the question. So at our East 60th and McKinley site, um, there is a curfew uh, in place on that site, and that's an 11 p.m. curfew out there. That curfew was established in partnership with the Community Advisory Council. So the Community Advisory Council requested that curfew and requested that time. So again, I think that same type of curfew will be in place at Sixth and Orchard, and if we need to adjust timing or something like that to better serve the needs of the neighborhood, we certainly can look at that. Um, the second part of that question, Kenny, could you repeat it again? I apologize. Uh, will uh, the gate be locked? Oh, yes, thank you. The gates are always locked, actually. They are a locked um, entry, and they can only, uh, folks are only allowed entry when the security staff provides that entry. Okay, thank you. And um, I would, just to add one more thing to that, Kenny, and this is just, to, I want to provide some context. So. There is an 11 p.m. curfew, but Allison could talk about it. there's kind of two reasons why residents are not are able to be out past 11 o'clock at night. 
One is if they have a job, which a good reminder is residents of these sites do have jobs. They, they work or they go to school. So they're, if they're working a night shift job, they're able to go do that. Or if they have medical issues like medical appointments or they've been admitted to a hospital, they're able to leave to receive those services. So I think that's just another point that I think it's missed is that you know, these residents, some of them have jobs um, and they're, they're working hard and they're trying to get up on their feet. Thank you, council member. We got this question a lot from folks. Um, this person mentions that there's a retirement home in close proximity to the housing location. Um, how's it being accepted there by owners and residents? And I think people are wondering in general about outreach to that community. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. So Pastor Blaisdell, council member Hines and myself actually met with um, one of the, uh, the executive director of that facility as well as several of their board members just yesterday to review some of their questions their concerns how things would operate um, they will uh, be transmitting those notes and information to their residents i have taken several phone calls from their residents really just asking questions about how the site will operate what the coming and going will be like what quiet hours are which by the way the village is all uh operate with a 10 p.m. kind of quiet hour. You need to be in your micro shelter site, you know, no yelling, screaming, that kind of thing. So um, we had a, a very productive conversation, talked about some ways that we could beautify the screening for them so that there are, you know, maybe some plantings on the outside. So again, that they're not looking maybe directly at that black security fence, but have, have some beautification going on there. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I look forward to probably more conversations with them as the site develops. I don't know, Councilmember Hines, if you have any commentary on that one. No, I think it was a very good meeting just to talk through um, some of the concerns and, and see what we can do to mitigate a lot of the concerns. Um, you know, as you found out, there's lots of questions and, and we do our best to answer them. Um, but, but I think I am and the city's committed, I, I imagine Lehigh, and the church are all committed to being good neighbors to that site and to do what they can to support them. Thank you. And just for transparency's sake, as you may notice, um, we have, um, we're in Zoom webinar, which is a little bit different format. So our residents can't see everything that I can see. So I wanted to let people know that we have over 200 people in attendance today and we've received 367 questions now and on top of the 12 pages of questions we got before we started. So there's a lot of engagement today and the number hasn't changed from 202 since the beginning of the meeting. So it seems like every single person is staying. So there's just a lot of interest. So thank you all for being here. We're still gonna, I'm gonna run through as many questions as we can get to in 20 minutes. So our next question is from Destiny. Is this completely free housing for people experiencing homelessness? Are they expected to get jobs during their stay? Uh, yes, Kenny, there is no rent uh, that these individuals pay. And yes, um, if they, that is something that they need to stabilize employment, then yes, um, we do encourage them towards that employment. They also, the, the requirement is uh, engagement with case management services. So whatever they need, again, to make that stabilization and successful transition to uh, housing. Thank you. Our next question is anonymous. Um, this person wants to know, is there a time limit on how long one family can stay? Right now, Kenny, we do not have a uh, stay policy at any of our micro shelter sites. Um, and we haven't generally had an issue with folks, again, engaging with their case manager and engaging with their housing stability plan to make progress on those housing stability plans. If it does become an issue, then that is something that the city can uh, negotiate with Lehigh to put something in place if necessary. Thank you. Um, we got a lot of questions. Um, I, I, I believe you covered it in the presentation, but will you say it again about um, the makeup of who can stay at the site? People are wondering, is it families? Is it just men? Is it, people are just kind of wondering that, that what that is. Yep, absolutely. So again, the site will serve homeless families with children single women and couples all right thank you Ooh, you answered that so quickly i didn't have the next one queued up yet 
That's okay, Kenny, can I share my screen really quickly? Because I am seeing yeah. from staff that there are some concerns about the restrooms on site. And so I'd yes. like to again show the site plan um, and just demonstrate for folks. Um, if you look towards the top of that diagram where it says kitchen community tents, there's a building next to it that says hygiene and then a smaller square that actually says laundry. That hygiene facility has restrooms as well as showers. Thank you, Allison. That is a question we got a lot, so I'm really glad you noticed that. And I'm gonna stop sharing now, Kenny. Thank you. Oh, da, 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 da. sorry. There's so many questions, but we've gone over a lot of these. Can I answer one I saw, Kenny, just real Please quick? Please do. Please. Uh, so somebody asked, I said that number 1,497 homeless children in the city of Tacoma. What you have to recognize, that's a, in some ways like, and then Ms. Stewart said the 1,800 people who were counted as being homeless. Uh, one thing you have to understand is that homeless students is they were homeless at some point in time during the year. And then another point, which I think has not been mentioned, because I hear people say, I only see homeless men out. And I think what's being missed is that homeless children are often not on the streets, that is correct, but they're doubled up, they're with relatives and they're sleeping with a car. And homeless women are often sleeping in cars, sleeping with relatives. They don't have a home, but you just don't see them on the street. They're still dealing with the same issues and lack of stability. So I think that's just an important point to make sure we're making, which is they are there. Like there are homeless women and children in our community that will be served by this site. And just because you don't see them on the street doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, and I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about that further, but, th but they're there. And, you know, some of my homeless students, I was a teacher for a long time. You would, you never know. Um, they don't live in the street or on a tent, but um, they didn't have a place to call home. Thank you, council member. All right, we've got a lot of questions that are similar to this one. Um, if, uh, what happens if a resident of this site um, breaks code of conduct, has discipline issues, how will those issues be handled? And if they do have to leave, where, where do they go? Thank you, Kenny. I'm actually gonna ask Josh Castle with Lehigh to come on and talk about kind of how the code of conduct operates um, on their site and exactly what that process looks like, Josh. Thank you, Allison. Yeah, that's a good question. So we have a, a code of conduct that all the residents uh, have to agree to and abide by as a condition of staying at the site, um, as we do at the other sites. Um, if somebody is in violation of the code of conduct, um, it depends on the severity, uh, the seriousness of it, and the frequency of it. I, if it involves um, violence or it's something that involves the safety of the village residents, then that's a situation where they may need to uh, exit uh, immediately. And we um, work with the city on, um, and our case managers work with can still work with the resident if they've been if they've had to exit on um, other options uh, uh, appropriate shelter for their needs or uh, or housing if it's um, another another issue on there uh, on the code of conduct that is not an immediate safety risk for the village uh, we have a multi-step disciplinary process uh, that we go through and if the person is in violation uh, so often of something then that um, you know we we follow that and that they may uh, it may lead to them having to exit the the village but we do enforce that um, and so if if you live at uh, the Thames uh, site um, you have to follow the code of conduct. Josh, can I keep you on? Um, this one applies to you. What kind of background checks are required for residents? And you can can you just talk a little bit in general about vetting folks, how they end up um, applying or getting in. Yeah, so when a resident uh, is intaked into the village, and uh, Eric might be able to, to add a little bit of detail to this, um, we check the sex offender registry. So if they're on the registry, they're not allowed into the village. Um, we also do background checks. And if there's a situation where they have something that is that would affect the safety of the, you know, of the residents, um, if it's if it's serious enough, um, that may be a situation where they won't be able to um, to, to intake into the village. So we do, we do check on those things. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Eric has anything to add, but that's, that's basically how it works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, thanks, Josh. All right, Allison, next question. Um, how will COVID-19 be handled in the camp? 
I'm actually gonna turn that one over to Josh as well. He can talk about the protocols they have in place for masking, social distancing, and hand wash. Yeah, so um, at all of our village sites, um, and I think everyone, everyone's, adjust, everyone's adjusted in the best way they can to this, um, we, have, we follow the public health uh, guidelines um, and all of the residents, when they're outside of their tiny house, um, they're required to wear a face mask. Um, if they enter, in, enter, enter into a community space like a, a kitchen uh, that we have on site, um, we limit the number of people that can be in there at one time. Um, everybody has to be apart. They can't gather into groups um, into close proximity. And um, we also have a very vigilant uh, group of, of amazing staff who um, wipe down and sanitize everything and keep everything very, uh, very clean. Um, and we also have, you know, there's no visitors allowed for this reason as well when it comes to, to keeping um, residents, um, to reducing their, their risk as much as possible of contracting, um, you know, their exposure to COVID. Um, so that's, that's part of it is allowed, no, no visitors allowed right now. Um, and we, we, have, we have all this uh, printed out and posted and um, the staff walk through the residents, walk through with each of the residents on this. Um, they, do have, they do have community uh, meetings, um, but it's, they're very, you know, everybody has to sit apart and wear their face mask when they do that. Um, and that's, that's the extent. So they, they are following all the public health guidelines and trying to be um, as vigilant as possible on, on keeping uh, the residents and really the entire community um, safe from COVID. Josh, you know, I have one more for Lehigh. Sure. Um, so I got, I have maybe five questions or so that are from residents who have heard um, about crime rate increases, especially um, near Se your Seattle sites. Can you speak to that or, or just crime or your observations around crime near sites? Uh, sure. So, um, so they have studied this before. There was actually a um, an, an extensive uh, news report uh, that was, I believe, it, I believe it was in the Guardian, and I can send that out. Um, they studied the, they did a, a study of all the village sites, and it found that there was no, there was actually no um, increase in in crime um, in the surrounding community when when a village is is placed. Um, and and in one case, we have a, another site where the um, where the village was was placed before it was sort of a empty um, property and and dilapidated and there was um, all kinds of um, activity and loitering and crime and other things going on and when the village was was put in place it actually added more eyes to the neighborhood um, because we have 24 7 security we do um, perimeter checks uh, around the village to just make sure everything's everything's going okay outside of the village um, and we engage with the neighbors. If there's a concern that they see, um, they let us know and we work with them on it. And we call, you know, we call 911 if we reckon, if we see something that's happening outside of the village that needs to be addressed. Um, and we have one report where a, a grocery store actually told us that their shoplifting went down um, after the village was, was in place. Um, we, we hear this from the community police officers that we work with at each of our sites. Um, we hear this from CAC members, uh, many of, many who are um, who are have have some you know deep concerns um, about a village uh, being sited and placed uh, um, near where they live in their community, and then they serve on the CAC. They they engage with the staff and the residents and get to know them, um, and they see that it's not it's not um, you know it it there's not any increase in um, in crime in their community. And we like I said we enforce the code of conduct, and on the code of conduct it says no it's specific and, and everyone has to read this and agree to it before living there that there's no there's no um you know no loitering no disturbing of neighbors we have quiet hours um so we we take it we really take it to heart to be um very engaged with the community because it's that's going to that's going to make the bill the bill successful is that we're working with the community and we have this community support All right thanks john oh go ahead council member I just want to reiterate a point, right? Because I live a block away. Like I've said that to many of you. I could see the site from my front door. Like I could see it, I live a block away. Um, I have already talked to many of you about concerns on that big vacant piece of property the church currently holds. Of people camping, 
of people loitering, of people in the bus stop. In my mind, having people on that property 24 hours a day with 24 hour security, with somebody monitoring that site all the time, I think it's actually gonna make that site safer, in my opinion. Because right now, there's no one there. And it's a big black hole in the middle of my neighborhood where people can hide out in the woods, where who knows what's going on. And now we're gonna take that big open space that has been an issue, and I agree it's been an issue. We're gonna put people there, remember again, women, families, children, couples, that have all signed a code of conduct, and they're gonna be there 24 hours a day. And there's gonna be on-site security that's gonna walk around and monitor. So if people are doing things they shouldn't be, which happens in that area, there's someone who can see it and call 911. I think it will actually help get more eyes in that neighborhood than there currently are. Um, so that's just, I just wanna make sure I'm really clear about that, that I think this will actually have an impact. And, and I've talked to the city manager, and if, if citizens are interested, we can overlay a crime map on the neighborhood and start tracking property crime in that area. If that's something people are interested, in, I'm more than happy to do that. But I think it's actually gonna be a benefit for that purpose. Thank you, council member. My next question is actually for you. I'm gonna paraphrase it because we're running out of time. We have numerous questions about people. They're just wondering about the process. They're wondering city council's role in this. Mm -hmm. Is this something you voted on? Is this something the community should have voted on? How does this work and what is council's role? Well, great question. We have not voted yet. So I think Allison talked about it ahead of, ahead of time. October 20th, there'll be a vote on the lease agreement for this property between the city and the church so that it can operate. So October 20th, that's not this upcoming Tuesday, but the next Tuesday. So there's no been no vote and no, pro, no dirt will be turned before that vote happens. But just to kind of walk back, um, we know the city, we city council was briefed on September 14th, Allison, am I correct? 15th, 16th, 15th. and a press release, what's that? The 15th council 15th. member. Um, and so notice went out then um, to kind of let the neighbor, so it went through the newspaper and then we followed postcards and I've heard from many people. Nobody reads the newspaper anymore. Um, postcards didn't come out till two weeks later. Uh, and so I understand that we need to refine the process for notice, but I guess one of the things I, the question I, um, come back to again and again um, with the notice question is what, what would extended notice do? Because the people I talked to who wanted more notice, their main motivation was I wanted more notice so I could stop the siting of this on a piece of private property that somebody else owns. Um, and that, that's, I, you know, there's a, there's a challenge with that because, um, if we have prior notice on any time we try to help people experience homelessness, I, I think it would be very, very difficult for us to find locations where we could put, where we could help serve people. And this is a desperate need. Um, I'm all for look, refining the process and we can look forward at maybe, and I've heard people say things about citing their schools, citing their businesses. We can talk about that kind of stuff um, to, to figure out maybe where these don't go, but, I would just say that the, the church is the one who initiated, they're the ones who offered the property and we let the public know as soon as we knew, as soon as we were told at our council meeting, the information went out to the public. So the public was getting notice, I mean, pretty soon. Allison, do you wanna add anything to that about the notice for this site versus the one on 60th McKinley? Um, no, I, I would emphasize council member Hines as well that we are operating under the uh, emergency declaration, which does uh, does cause us to move very, very quickly. And so I can understand why the community would feel like, hey, how can this happen so fast? And partly it's because it is, uh, we are functioning under that emergency declaration. So that's the other thing I would stress. Um, we did learn from East 60th and McKinley and did provide um, as much kind of a head notice. And that's why when the press release went out to the newspaper, yes, it was two weeks before the postcard, but that's because that's kind of the beginning of our, our process. And there does always have to be a first conversation, right? And so coming to council, that was our first conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. We are out of time. Could you, um, before we go, 
Um, I, I want to end the meeting with Councilmember Hines giving closing thoughts, but before then, could you tell us what we're going to do? We have over 430 questions that we weren't able to get to. Can you let us know how we're going to handle that? And then absolutely. also share your closing thoughts. Yep, absolutely. So thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. A couple of things. This meeting was recorded and will be posted to our website at www.cityoftacoma.org forward slash authorized encampments. So if you had friends or neighbors who couldn't tune in today, that opportunity to tune in both in English and in Spanish will be available on our website probably in the next day or so. Over the next about week, week and a half, since we have so many questions, staff will be uh, looking at all of those questions, consolidating them into an FAQ document so that we can post that to our website. And then we will also post all of the raw questions and comments to our website so that you all can see those um, for our transparency factor. Um, and again, that will take us a little bit of time to work through probably the next week, week and a half. Um, in the meantime, shelters at cityoftacoma.org. If you have questions that were unanswered and would like to email those, uh, I am more than happy to answer those. Or you can give me a call, 253-591-5119. Again, that's 253. 591-5119 and I will endeavor to get back to you and answer any and all questions and I also extend the offer to meet with any neighborhood groups that might need a meeting to discuss the project. Councilmember Hines. Uh, thank you Allison and uh, first of all I just want to thank everyone who was with us today so all the speakers um, Michael Mira from Tacoma Housing Authority, Lua Pritchard, um, Ronnie Brown, Sharon Lee, Linda Stewart, Eric Davis, Josh Castle, and our Councilmember Hunter who's with us here today, um, and Joe Davis. Councilmember Hunter, can you come on the screen? There we are. Um, for, I appreciate everybody who is here today um, to share their thoughts about this potential project. Um, you know, I've said this multiple times, and I'm very honest about this. I live a block away from this project. Um, I can see it from my front door. I know many of you here on the call with me are my neighbors. I, I would just come back to a couple final thoughts. Number one, we're talking about the, the critical issue here is homelessness and people experiencing homelessness who are in our community. And more simply, we're talking about women with children and families experiencing homelessness. Some of the most vulnerable people in our community and what we're looking at is an opportunity to put their lives on a path for a brighter future, not for me, not for just them, but for the entire community that is the city of Tacoma. I am confident that this project will be well done, that it will be well managed, and that we can address the concerns that the neighbors have about this because their concerns are the same as mine. I have two small children. I put my life savings in this home that I own, which is very modest here in the north end of the city of Tacoma. I pay my taxes. I pay my utility bill. I love and care about my neighborhood. I hear all of the concerns, but I know that the concerns I've heard are also the exact same concerns that I heard from the neighbors around the 60th and McKinley site, because there is not a neighborhood in the city of Tacoma that doesn't love itself, that doesn't care about itself, that doesn't have children that the parents care about, that don't have homeowners that have done everything they can to buy those homes. There is not one neighborhood here. I hear a lot of people say, why here? Why not someplace else? And the question I have to ask is, why not here? Why not step up? We live in an amazing part of town. I say I live in the best neighborhood in the city of Tacoma. I'll be flat out. And I think this is an opportunity for us to show our city how to do this right. And if there are issues, I can promise you I'm going to know about them long before you do, because I live a block away, and I'll see them. And I'm committed to do what we can to make sure that this site is a success. So I look forward in the weeks ahead. And remember, 
next Tuesday at community forum, you can speak and share your thoughts. So if you've sat through this entire meeting and you're ready to share your thoughts, you can come and do that. And then when this goes on the agenda for the vote on October 20th, you can have almost up to five minutes to share your thoughts about this. But what I wanna just continue to remind you of is this is an opportunity to do this right. And everyone is committed to it. And so in those two weeks from now until October 20th, if you wanna reach out to me and talk about your concerns and help have me help think through how we mitigate those concerns, like how do we, how do we address loitering? How do we address tents? How do we address trash? I'd love to talk about that. I think we have some good ways to deal with that. And I'm more than happy to have that conversation over the next two weeks. Um, so thank you all very much. I see my email address is popping up online. Um, I've talked to many of you already, um, and I look forward to talking to many more of you between now and October 20th. So thank you very much, um, and thank you everyone who participated. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Keep the room open for five more minutes so I can copy and paste all the questions. So if you have a last question, throw it on there. I'll make sure it gets to staff. But otherwise, I'm going to say goodbye to all of our panelists and thank you to everyone for being here.